Welcome to Deep Look, Multiworld's weekly radio show about the current state of Ultimate. I'm the host and the editor of Multiworld, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Ultiworld senior editor, Keith Rayner. Keith, did you enjoy this year's Super Bowl? I, I most assuredly did not. Uh, I don't, how could anybody enjoy? Are, are, you, you, a, are you a Brady hater? Uh, I am, but you know, full full, full credit to Brady. Uh, goat status achieved. Uh, you you got to give it up. Another team turn around and win. Guy's got an insane title winning percentage in a sport that I think it's really hard to be to have that kind of longevity. Takes a little bit of luck, but a ton of skill. Uh, I, I've always been a like Peyton's the best I've ever seen, uh, but you know it's hard to argue with the results. Although to be fair. Brady could have gone out there and basically spiked the ball for three quarters and still won. It's true. given that it's the true. opposing team, the best offense in the league, one of the best offenses in NFL history, couldn't score a touchdown. It's honestly insane. It's insane. And the the memes about Pat Mahomes, this poor guy, like literally doing the most insane stuff <laughs> and it not working is where I'm like when he threw the completely horizontal laying out pass I've never and seen somehow like drilled somebody in the face, his own receiver, and the guy fails to catch it. Like you got to go up to him after the game and be like, I'm sorry that I just ruined what could have been the greatest play in NFL history. It was just insane. Like, off my face. He threw so. a strike right to the dude <laughs> and he dropped it. I mean, what are we doing here? The guy's he's full layout. <laughs> It's and truly throwing sidearm like, and throws it. Well, that was a, probably a forty-yard pass. I mean, it was insane. My, uh, my wife was like, "He looked, he looked dead in the eyes after he that." He did. Moment. He did. I mean, he, he clearly wasn't one hundred percent. Also, like he was limping on the field. Um, the game planning from the Chiefs coaching staff, I'm not impressed. I mean, they they got too high safety the whole game and never adjusted. It felt like. I mean, they just never dealt with the fact that they had acres of open space in the underneath i don't understand um it was uh it was a rough rough day for really both the kansas city o and defense um but you know you know that brady played well you know he didn't throw a pick uh and well let's uh, you know, quick betting recap how to go for you did you did you uh, come out ahead or did you lose a little bit I, I lost a little bit and i'm not surprised given that the script of the game went probably the the into the the quadrant of the potential outcomes that I thought was the least likely, which is slow bucks blowout like yeah. that. That's, yeah. that's basically not, I think the least likely outcome there. So uh, my betting day, you know, not horrible. I had a couple hits. I think Tyreek in the, in the garbage time managed to get over the uh, necessary receptions uh, to get me there to, to carry that one. Uh, but also didn't win any squares, which kind of, yeah, stuck, me neither. So. Uh, squares are squares are fun, but I know that they are basically setting money on fire. So yeah, you know, there's yeah, don't count on but it. But it's fun. It is fun. It gives you something to, to cheer for. You know, right? Uh, it's like I need a safety and then a touchdown <laughs> with a two point conversion for no reason. Right. Um, I got I got a little I got a lucky. I mean, I threw away money on the Chiefs second half. Like at halftime, I'm like, all right, the Chiefs are going to start I, scoring. I I almost did that, and then the book took down the line because. The Chiefs were were driving, I think, and then the Bucks scored again, and I was like, "Wow, I'm really glad I didn't." Thank do God that. I didn't do it. So I, I I threw away some of my winnings, but I did great on on props. All my props came through. I got a little lucky because I had Bucks more punts than Chiefs, and I only got there because the Bucks had two punts in the fourth quarter where they were you know just running the football and they were way up, so they had no reason to throw ever. Or try to push for first downs besides just running it up the gut. Um, so that was a little lucky, but uh, I came away up. I think I think I won twenty bucks because I bet on the Bucks point plus three and a half. So are you are you counting your big future bet on the Chiefs in that? I, that it sucks that it didn't come through. I mean, I was rooting for a small Kansas City win. Um, uh, that I lost one dollar on that. Gotcha. Uh, so the game pretty miserable. I mean, it wasn't even yeah, really was a, a particularly game. exciting game. It wasn't great to watch. You know, oh, Mahomes is just like under constant duress. So I thought the refs was, were way too involved in the game. Uh, too I, I, I rarely take that stance. And most of the time when people are like, well, the refs are too involved. I was like, well, maybe the players should cheat less. Like <laughs> it, they're breaking the rules too much. Don't blame the refs, but blame, blame the players for holding too frequently, like, or too egregiously. Sure. sure I agree. So, uh, but in general, but, um, but well, what did what you think was, in this case? 
I, well, I thought there were a couple calls, especially defensive pass interference, that didn't belong. Yeah, the because holding that brought back the the interception. Uh, oh. That was that was not great. Uh, it was a very very light hold on the defense. Uh, but you know, it's no surprise that there were. Uh, to be, I, I will say, I I thought the refs were were maybe a little touchy on that. But for the most part, you saw the Chiefs defense making terrible decisions. They got killed the whole game. Bad penalties. I, right? I don't think this game was so, decided by the refs. I think you no. know, it might have been a closer game. But the, but you could also see like a a trend of the Chiefs taking bad penalties, whether it's 100%. uh holding at the wrong time the offsides or on the, on the, the, they took an unsportsmanlike the early in the game. Uh, you know, they, they made a lot of bad decisions that, yeah. that really hurt them in the first, I think the first three penalties they took and they took the first three penalties in the game all cost them first downs. Yeah. Uh, so it was, that was pretty brutal for them, but you, you got uh, any thoughts on the commercials? Yeah. I, I love the commercials. I'm someone who, you know, I have a, a master's in, in marketing. I, I, this is like, the Super Bowl for football is also the Super Bowl for advertising. It's the biggest advertising weekend. Uh, and I, I thought this was a pretty underwhelming stock of commercials, but there was some interesting stuff. Uh, the Oatly commercial, did you see that one? Uh, the, where the, basically just the Oatly CEO in the middle of a field singing out. Not very I heard about this, but I actually haven't seen it. It's yeah, it's bizarre. Like a, it was very bizarre, very, very off kilter. And I appreciated that it stood out from the rest. It was like, yeah. We're going to pair back. And also I found out afterwards that this is an ad from 2014 that was banned in their home country of Sweden because the dairy lobby uh, lobbied against them being able to show it. So oh, wow. that made me like it more. Basically, like they were like, look, we have no milk and that's cool. And the dairy lobby was like, to hell with that. You can't, you can't do that. I don't know how they what the legal standing is for that not being allowed. But uh, there you go. Dairy lobby is powerful in Sweden, I guess. I think they're uh, still fighting about whether you can call – Oat milk. milk, milk. That's fair. That's a, that, I guess that's kind of fair. Uh, but I, I thought that it was interesting, if not like particularly compelling. You know, there's the Michael B. Jordan Alexa ad. Mm-hmm. Michael B. Jordan is just, we've we've talked on this show. I stand for Michael B. Jordan. You do. Stand. He's sure fire hit. Uh, the guy's just a, a magnetic presence. So if he's in a commercial, although the the commercial itself is actually pretty funny too. Uh, so they so they got that one right. Um, there's the Sesame Street one. Uh, with, uh, with David Diggs. Is that the guy from uh, from uh, Hamilton? Yes. Is that his name? Yes. yes. Uh, he had like a – I don't like that it is necessarily for DoorDash, I think it was, because I think all the delivery companies are probably evil tech corporations. Leaches. But yeah. Uh, they, and they're, they're trying to push this like, oh, really, by using our major tech conglomeration, you're yeah. supporting local. You're like really being a community member. As, as we member. take like 25% fees from the restaurant. Yeah, rather than like you could just go to the restaurant, but if you really cared. But anyway, uh, the commercial was charming because Sesame Street and W Diggs, W's across the board for that one. Any Anything stand out to you? Any, uh, any, I, know, I know this is more my bag than yours, but. I, it was a. Um... It was a little flat this year for me, just in general. Not a lot of stuff stood out. Um, some people were talking about the five-second Reddit ad. Yes, that's. I thought that was very funny, even though I didn't actually see it. I, I saw think, it on Twitter. Yeah, I, I missed it in real time. I think that that kind of... Um, I think that's the, the right way to approach Super Bowl advertising is like, you want to be... You want to stand out and for, for better or for worse. Like, you want people to notice the ad especially when you're you know paying so much money for it. So like people are all talking about this 5 second Reddit ad in the newspapers afterwards. To me that's like such an obvious win plus they paid, you know, probably a, a fifth or a sixth of what you would normally pay. I think the um, biggest win is if you can get people to look up your ad afterwards and that's sure. what the Reddit ad does. And for yeah. less money than, you know, the full 30 second ads with tons of celebrities of which there were many uh, I, like the Doritos ad, I feel like I've seen as one of the top ones on a lot of lists. It was like Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis and uh, oh, that was Sean that, Paul. That, that was probably the one that I thought was the best. Oh, I did not like that. Oh, I, I thought it was good. I thought it was good because it randomly had Shaggy come through. Right. So one of the tweets like the I saw Cheeto dust on the walls. One of the tweets I saw was basically it was like every Super Bowl commercial uh, colon as if every Super Bowl commercial was saying this and it was like, remember this thing? And that commercial <laughs> felt yeah. so much like that. Plus, I don't like Ashton Kutcher. He's oh, not okay. charming. Well, you're, so you're an uh, Ashton Kutcher hater. But no, I, I thought the concept, there's at the very end of the commercial, they do like 
a moment where he goes, was it you? And she goes, it wasn't me. And then it cuts to Sean Paul and he's like, I can't believe that worked or something like that. That should have been that. Not the whole song. I, like you don't have to explain it was long. the joke it was like a to minute. me. Yeah. yeah, like just have him say it wasn't me, and then Sean Paul's randomly there. That's funny. One thing but the I whole did, like Ashton Kutcher singing thing. No, yeah. not funny. One thing I did notice is that there were a lot of ads, even including celebrities like this one, where the celebrities were at home and in- interacting mm-hmm. as though they were just like in their normal lives. Which I to me that's like that must have been some ad agencies like this is what we're gonna do. Because everyone's locked down, everybody's at home, so we're we still want celebrities because we want people to care about the commercial, but we're going to put them at home and make it feel kind of just like you being at home. Um, I, I thought that was an, an an interesting way of approaching it. I prefer that to the kind of like schmaltzy, you know, we're all in it together stuff, which I I find sort of oh the Bruce Springs, when it, Bruce Springsteen ad. ads. Oh jeez, no, <laughs> no, stop it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all, all in all, not, not an impressive uh, crop of commercials. I think it's a difficult but. year to advertise. You know, yeah, it's like it's hard to get the, the tone right. I mean, I, I th- there was like a I think it was Bud Light did the Bud Light Lemon ad where it was like a lemon of a year. And like they went back through the year, but it was like raining lemons the whole time. Like that, conceptually, the ad itself wasn't great, but like that's playing off of. Right. You know, how people feel about the year right. in a way that was was smart. There was another beer ad, too, that was like about the point of buying a beer. And it was like buying a beer is never about the beer. And it's like all the times that you buy somebody a beer and it's more meaningful than it is like, oh, here's alcohol that I'm giving you. Right. Uh, right. That was that was a smart idea, even though the commercial itself didn't actually deliver necessarily on the concept. But those are the kind of ideas I, I look for. But there's certainly trends to be looked at in the advertising space that come to fruition through the Super Bowl, which is sure. just this advertising mega space. Sure. Um, so we're going to get into the bulk of our show here. Uh, we're going to be talking to Dom Fontanet, the legendary uh, Hall of Famer playing for Seattle Riot for most of the last few years. And uh, she just announced that she'll be retiring from the game uh, p- following you know, this year off. This maybe could end up being two years off. Um, so we're going to have her on to talk about her career, some of her thoughts on today's game, and a bunch more. So stick around. It's Deep Look. Joining us now on Deep Look is the Hall of Famer Dominique Fontenet, who won four national championships in the club division, Won a college title with Stanford back in 1997. Seven world championships and a Callahan Award. Dom, welcome to Deep Look. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Um, So, you know, the sort of specific reason that we're having you on this week as opposed to any other time, of course, we could probably have you on literally any time, is that you recently announced in a blog post on B Ultimate's website that you're going to be retiring from Ultimate. Um, I know, you know, you and I talked on the Sideline Talk podcast a couple of years ago. We got into the topic of, you know, when will your career come to an end? Um, what uh, what prompted the decision at this point to say, I'm I'm done. I'm, I'm stepping away after a, an incredible career. Well... I mean, I've been trying to be done for years and just never felt like the right time. Like I'd say, okay, this is my last season, everybody. And then we'd have some event at nationals, whether it be like the most amazing, you know, like fun time ever, or we would like lose sadly in, you know, quarters. Not that, not that that wasn't, um, like the exact reason, but just, there's something that I always felt like I got to play one more year. And then, um, and then the pandemic hit this time. So it's like, uh, to, to keep pushing, it just felt like more effort than I felt like it was time. Like the world was like, no, you you need to stop playing Frisbee at this point. You know, I'm going to send a whole world pandemic down and no one's going to play. Not that that's pretty self-centered to say that, but um, but it definitely the pandemic had a huge impact on just making it real. We, we were for, we were fortunate enough to have you on a, a sideline talk episode, and and I know during that 
Uh, you talked about kind of wanting to sort of leave on your own terms uh, to, to not get forced out of the game. How much did it mean to you kind of, I, I guess in some ways you could argue you were, you're were pushed by outside forces into this situation, but ultimately you got to say, I, I, I'm, I'm ready to stop. How much did it mean to you to, to leave on your own terms? I mean, that's huge for my ego. <laughs> you know, I, I never wanted to be that player that they were like, well, let's just put her on the team because, you know, like we can't like cut her because, but, um, that, that was big for my, my ego, for my personal feeling of, of wanting to, um, continue being, you know, some sort of on-field contributor, um, you know, cause at, at some point people did start to see me as a little bit of more of the off field, you know, uh, mentoring coaching kind of person on the team, um, which feels good too, but I, I really like personally wanted to keep physically performing. So that felt good. I mean, you know, you were still getting re- meaningful minutes. I mean, even in the 2019 season. So I, you know, I feel like it's uh it's not like you are the N, you know, the NBA veteran who gets brought on simply to be a coach basically and never get any time. Um, but you know, when you kind of, sum up the career uh 26 years as it's been calculated 90 was it 97 uh no no 97 is when you won your championship 1993 to 2019 26 years uh a a remarkable career by any standards and with all of the winning that you did you know what are some of the like key highlights that you pick out from this this period um uh, and all the years of playing the game Mm -hmm. Well, let me back up and say, I didn't even notice anyone. I didn't think anyone would really even notice. No, no offense, be ultimate. Like I, I know people are going to read the blog, but I didn't expect to get the, you know, the recognition or people texting and emailing me saying how, whoa, you know, like, you know, your retirement, you're retiring. So that was kind of a surprise. I thought I was just kind of like sliding out the back door. Um, But to answer your question about the things I remember about key moments, I think it all kind of jumbles up to these like random moments in time um, on each team. Like one of, one of the moments I remember is playing for Godiva and um, having been on the West coast where things are a little more free flowing. So you, you, you throw the huck when you think it's like a 50, 50 ball and maybe they'll catch her. If not, you just play defense, but on Godiva, they had a different system that I wasn't familiar with. And that was why they were so good. They took calculated um, precision like passes. And one of my first practices there, I had the disc and I saw someone going deep and I hooked it. And it was like a marginal hook, you know, it was going to get caught maybe. And one of their players, this woman, Judy Laser, looked at me and she was like, what the was that? You know, and I was like, whoa, this is a different, <laughs> this is a different world. So like it's those those moments that kind of stand out where I like learn, it's those moments where you learn something or that you're kind of shocked. And that was a moment where I learned, OK, this is a different system and they do it in a different way and they depend on like they're more team teamwork oriented system as opposed to uh, individual athleticism plays. And so it's like those moments I remember not necessarily like big wins or big losses. I mean, you remember those too, but, but it's those moments. How have you seen this game and this community change over the length of your career, you know, as someone who was, really playing at the highest levels from near the beginning of your career to the end. How have you seen, I guess it's so broad a question. How have you seen elite ultimate change just in that time? Yeah, I feel like this, this uh, comes up and I feel like a little defensive at times. People are like, it's gotten so much more athletic, you know, like that. Um, And that there's some, there's some truth to that. 
in that the depth of the teams across the board have gotten like more athletes have joined the sport. I want to say not that players playing before weren't athletes, but just like more athleticism, you know, like the training has gotten better, that kind of thing. But if you look across the board back then, if you took those top, you know, 10 players on those top teams, they are just Jim Perinella, all those players were just as athletic. Uh, Dennis Worson, just as tall, could jump just as high as the as the players of today. Um, and so that's one question that kind of comes up. As far as like the community, I feel like when I first started playing, uh, there were definitely like, there was a West Coast vibe and an East Coast vibe. And then there were the people in the middle and there was like the Southern vibe. And it was, it was much more of um, like kind of a separate culture in those different communities. And now it feels a lot more blended. feels like people are connecting more. I don't know if that has to do with the internet or just the, you know, people have become more um, social with each other. And, you know, maybe it has to do with like the national teams and how um, a lot of times in the past, the national team was the team that won nationals and now like it's selected. So now you have all these people coming from different teams and that community like extends to their teams. And so everyone feels a little more connected. So I think that that's kind of where I've seen it change. I mean, you know, you played in those national team settings in both ways. You know, you've been on selected teams. You've also been on the teams that won the championship before uh, they changed the rules about how they picked the U.S. national team. Did you have a preference for those? I mean, did how did you how would you compare those experiences? I, th- I think... Um, this is like the, the ego starts to get involved again. So the first in 2001, when um, Ultimate was first accepted into the World Games and UPA at the time selected the, the co-ed team that went. And like now it's like a huge tryout camp and, you know, it's selected. Um, but at that time, you, you, UPA just picked the team. They were like, oh, da, 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 da. they had... They had a board of people and they picked based on, you know, athleticism um, or like how you're playing, but also um, like who you would be as representing the, the country. And I honestly don't think that's changed, you know, like that's exactly the same criteria that they use to select now, except they bring everyone to a, a, a camp and do it in person. And the only thing that is different is that those small, that small outlier, that one or two players who weren't, weren't, you know, recognized nationally before that camp. Now they have a chance. So like um, I would, I would put someone like a Sandy Jorgensen probably wouldn't have gotten selected on that first national team because not, no one kind of really knew who she was at that point, you know, before that camp. And then people like, whoa, who is this woman? Let's put her on the national team. And then her career blossomed. So from like a personal standpoint, it did it doesn't feel too much different, except it kind of feels like those outliers were left out from that first thing. But it was, it felt just as amazing and the connections and the, you know, um, I think the team was just probably just as good as it would have been had they had a tryout selection. Um, So, but it it gives a little bit more fair shot for people who might be on the periphery now. Do you have like a, do you have like a four digit US UPA USAU ID? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Is it like eight? (laughs) On our, like Riot, Riot has a spreadsheet and we have like our name and then our age and of course, Gwen Ambler is like a next level Google spreadsheet or, you know, Excel spreadsheet or so it, she has all calculated where it changes every year and, you know, you don't have any go in and update it. But the column of our USAU number is just funny because we got like these players who just started the sport like three or four years ago with their digits were like 12 digits long and mine's like seven. You know, but it's funny. Mm. That's awesome. 
I, so I also want to ask, like, you, you started to compare kind of the athleticism of the older generation and, and the training and stuff. I mean, if 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 push came to shove, like if like the Godiva teams that you were on, if they played against Riot now, like, what do you think would happen? What do you think? What kind of score do you think? <laughs> All right. You got to you got to like give it some like thing. OK, so the Godiva of yesterday. I mean, we also had like 17 players and games went to <laughs> games went to 21. That's right. But, um, so if you took the top uh, 10 players on Godiva and you put them against the top 10 players on Riot. If you if you played one game and Riot was feeling good and in a great mood, they would win. Riot would win. But if you played a series of seven, I think Godiva would win because Godiva was so steady. You know, like I feel like Riot had their top their top 10 players are just amazing. Right. And but the mental fluctuation and the system of Godiva was just supreme. Like you can't, you couldn't beat that. Even with more athleticism, I think that like a series of seven Godiva win. Now, if you have to, if you have to play the whole team, Riot's gonna win because Riot's twenty, you know, twenty six player is outstanding, and Godiva can only play so many. So. But even there's so many, they got a lot of use out of because of the way their system worked. They could plug in those other players and not have a deficit on the field. And in fact, they had they had like a working cog. So it's a, that's a good question. Do you have any regrets about your career? Uh, yeah, I I touched a little bit on that um, in the Beat Ultimate article. In that, sometimes I think about the amount of time I spent playing and how much I missed, you know, uh, in my home life, my, like my family. And so that, that hits me hard. Um, I, I think back, like, wonder what it would have been like if I had done, you know, I don't know if it's a regret, but I wonder what it would have been like if I had worked out, you know, more when I was younger, because you just, you're, you're, at Kayamana and you, you wake up and you just go play, you know, like you don't even warm up. You know, that was my, my mentality back then. I, I was lucky. I think physically um, my body was lucky enough to be able to do that. But um, I think back, like how long could I be playing? Had I prepared in different ways? Um, but the, the part, the biggest like regret, I think is like not taking more time to go home. I lived, I lived in the West coast and the East coast and I did med school and all these things and, and, um, and just missing a lot of that, like home life. It's, I, I shudder to imagine that you may have been able to extend this career even like, what are you looking for? Like <laughs> five years? You no. Know? Yeah. yeah. I want to, <laughs> uh, I, I actually couldn't, I, I dye my hair. I'm like completely gray. Like no one believes me, but I'm gray. And I don't believe I, you. I'm not buying it. <laughs> yeah, no. For all, Madison Reed comes every six weeks. <laughs> so so in, in, in the career that you've had, who is someone, or if there's multiple someones that stand out as just the most difficult matchup for you? Oh, well... Memory fades, but there are some really tough matchups. I mean, I would just try to avoid them as being matched up. You know, if you're a seven on line, you got to like scoot over to the left, like you're talking to someone else, and then maybe they'll switch people on you. But, um, Sneaky. so, um, I want to say back in the day, it was a really fun and difficult matchup to match up with this woman called named Lori Parham. Um, She's newly inducted into Hall of Fame. She was just, she's from, I think she was playing in the South at the time, but she also played, ended up playing on Godiva and some of the um, other other area teams. But she was just, she was long, 
She was fast. She had great throws. She could jump. Um, she was smart. And then um, I, in more recent times, one of, I hate this matchup and Maddie Sang knows it. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. He just got lucky with it. But uh, Alden Fletcher, man, I, I hate that matchup. It's like she's a quiet player, but she's just always right there and she's smart. So um, I prefer the like youthful, wishful, hopeful, more athletic players that I can go ah, and then they like fly 30 feet <laughs> that way. And then I just go the other way. But when the player is like smart and perhaps a little more physical with me, I hated it because I just don't like to get touched. And I, you can give away all the secrets now because you know, yeah, what, do you, exactly. what do you got to be for? Yeah. So like Alden, you got that last one on me. You know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> you put that photo up on your Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> but there were some other ones. I got some other photos on you. So uh, good job, Alden. Uh, so what, what was your first year playing for Riot, if you can remember? Um, I think it was it was 2012, 11. So you, you played with the most oh. of the 2010s. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you won the world championship over Fury with that team in Lecco. Uh, but never won a national championship. What kept Riot, a, obviously a tremendously talented team, from winning a national championship? Well, we won two worlds. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's all I, I got. That's right. yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I don't, I mean, if I knew that, yeah, yeah if I knew the answer to that, we would have been winning. <laughs> um, but I want to say, like, we blamed a lot of things, you know, I want to say that every, every game, you know, when you get to that nationals level, it's just like, it's the inches that matter. Right. And, um, I don't, I don't want to piss people off, but I really do think that, um, like we, relied a lot on some as much as our system was was working and clicking and things I think in the end we ended up relying a little bit more on the athleticism than I would have preferred and when you get to those last moments and those you know you you need the athleticism but you also need the system to fall back on and and when you get fatigued that athleticism so that that like like if if Every pass to me should be a, a rotating disc into the player's stomach, as opposed to say, say someone's, this might get a little too technical, but say someone is running um, to the far right cone, you want to be throwing a leading pass where the disc is spinning into them, as opposed to a more challenging pass, which might be an inside out pass to them where the disc is spinning away. And, and so in earlier games and earlier tournaments, all those inside out passes work. But when you get to those moments in those critical, uh, when everyone's tired, everyone's playing harder, you know, you need those little things to, to count and matter. And I think we were still doing the other, you know, we weren't re relying on those like really basic things in the, in the, at the end. And that inside out pass is going to be just a little too far and it's going to bounce just a little, like maybe the wind's going to hit it and it's going to hit their hand and, and spin away as opposed to hitting their hand and spinning into them. And it's those, those little minutia, I think that, that made the difference in the end. Um, and maybe that's, that opinion is me trying to, you know, say I know something and I don't, but um, that, that's how I would, uh, how I would analyze it. I mean, when I think about the top teams, in really any division, a lot of times the games that truly count, there's maybe only two in a whole tournament. And I mean, in some ways you might even argue a whole season. There's a handful of games against the other elite competitors that truly matter. Sure. You might lose a game against a team that's below your level because you had a, you played poorly. You know, you, you might get a win that 
didn't mean as much because the teams weren't as focused. But like really, when it comes down to it, you're talking about semis and finals of nationals and maybe the finals of a tournament here and there that really define the season for the absolutely top level teams. So I've always thought that like, you know, when you just when you describe that, it's like things that work along the way that work most of the time. It's really about can you be prepared for those last one or two games because that seems to be where the you know yeah. the, the the whole tournament is decided. Yeah. Yeah. A, My internet's a little slow, but I, I think I heard you. And and I completely that's exactly the page I'm on. The the unfortunate thing, and and this is maybe me like uh, showing my age or my mentality around what Frisbee is to me, but it's like in order to make those last games and do the right thing in those, or what I call the right thing in those last games, you have to be doing it the whole time. And that's not like, that's not fun. I mean, it's, it's not as free flowing. It's not as exciting as, as, um, as throwing that, that hook to Jack who pulls it down over, you know, who skies the bejesus out of, um, you know, someone that's exciting. Right. But um, to hold that pass and throw the, like, you know, the, the right pass in, even in that moment is, is what builds your, your habits that will, and that tendency to do it in that final um, and I think that we, we just had too much fun playing with each other, but that's the whole point of the game, right? Is to have fun. So why would you want to drill sergeant? Um, and, and that's a fine balance. I think you need to have is like, why do we play? We play for the enjoyment. So if, if we're going to like drill these like unfun things to do, like, why are people playing? We're going to lose all of our good players. And, um, in my, like, thinking back on Godiva is like, that's what they did. They, they drilled us. And, and that part, the definition of fun for them was the process that got you to winning. And then once that whole tier of top players retired and they stopped winning, then it wasn't as fun because we weren't winning, you know? And so that <laughs> drilling part was, it was like, why are we doing this? This isn't fun. I don't play this game to do this. So I think, even though Riot didn't uh, win a national championship while I was on that team, um, I think that they really did a good job of of like keeping people playing because they wanted to make it uh, balanced and enjoyable. Well, I, I will say that that there is there is a lot of evidence that throw it up to Jack is a winning right decision in a lot of cases. <laughs> right. They we, don't, yeah, it's great. We we talk about them as, as someone who had perhaps the most dominant presence that we've ever seen in college ultimate and potentially could extend that into the club realm. In, in your mind, having seen so many great players through your career, where does someone – like Jack land in that conversation, do you feel like they have the potential to be one of, if not the greatest player to play? I mean, Jack, um, they even it's, I can't even express if it's one of those things that if I had their mentality back when I was that age, I don't, you know, it's like, I don't, they're so mature and, they're just such a hard worker. The combination of that with athleticism is, is I've never seen it. So, um, and then also just being a great teammate, like really a great teammate. I, um, I have to say like them playing was one of the reasons why I kept playing, like for sure. I wanted wow. to be able to play with them. Yeah. Definitely went into my thought process. I ranked Jack at number one in the women's division rankings that we did uh, last year in 2020. Obviously, there was no season, but kind of like looking at what happened in 2019 and making general projections for rankings of players. Uh, would Do you agree with that? Who, who's, who's number one right now in Ultimate in your mind? 
Well, I guess that's a that I don't that's a hard that's a hard uh, ball because I feel like every player's got their number one aspect to them, um, like well-rounded. Jack's definitely up there with regards to that. I think there's a lot to learn. Everyone has a lot to learn, uh, including Jack. So when you have to like make it number one, I think that's that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good bet on on Jack. But I I think, um, and I know this maybe this is too old school, but like an Alex Snyder is still up there in my number one. I like I don't care if Alex is. Uh, and she's, and she's not like, I don't care if she had her like Walker out there, but (laughs) just having her on the field and the way she commands the rest of the team to play, you can't like, like, you got to put that up there as well. So like, I mean, you could, there's a whole plethora of other players, you know, you'd say, um, Chastain, you know, like all those players, I guess my number one is like a player who has all those pieces, but then also like commands the people around them to play better as well. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Very, very different. my vote, but yeah. I don't there know. you go. Uh, I, I think I, I think I had Chastain, uh, but, but Charlie did have Jack. Alex, Alex Snyder is still going to get the break backhand off, even with the Walker out there. It's not a problem. I mean, Alex, <laughs> but the thing is, is that Alex is still sprinting, you know, like <laughs> still, and he's still getting D's. So. So yeah. you've played with Godiva, with Fury, with Riot. And if you look back at the, the final standings throughout you know, women's club ultimate, you see the same teams reappear over and over again. You see these title runs from teams, obviously Fury with the, with the 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 statement run that def, kind of defines it, but over the past few years, it's it's felt like maybe there are more teams in contention for the title than there were in the past. Is, is that something that you've noticed that there's a trend that we may see the end of these lengthy club women's dynasties? Um, there's definitely. I mean, throw brute squad in there too. You know, there's definitely um, that feeling that of old nationals, you know, you played those first two days to like warm yourself up and to get on the right strides for the, like, uh, you know, for the, for the quarter semis or actually more of the semis finals. And now it's like top teams are losing in the quarter. So yeah, absolutely. Like depth and, um, what's the word everybody, what's I'm, my vocabulary isn't it? Um, exactly what you're describing when the the field is parody is probably the word you're yeah, thinking parody about. that's the word um so i mean you already see it in the men's game or, or or more so in the men's game and definitely in the mixed game um but i you know like no we we scouted every team on that list uh, at nationals and we took as much time looking at their players, looking at the matchups. And so that's a huge change. That, and that goes to say, you know, that depth of athleticism and then has definitely increased. For sure. What's the most amazing play that you've witnessed on the field? Could be your own play. Could be somebody. <laughs> oh man. Um, well, Jack has done some crazy things. <laughs> <laughs> like what? We, we streamed uh, a game in 2019 against uh, Fury, and I think Jack had like five or six goals and three or four assists. I mean, it was insane. Yeah, I've never seen anything uh, like that. But some catches. Um, I mean, I will always bring up Molly Goodwin, and everyone's like, "Who? What?" But Molly Goodwin has done some insane things too like when was the last time i've seen a layout greatest you know like from a woman player i don't know but that was molly goodwin 
Um, Dana Greena, who, or I think her name is actually Dana Green, but um, she was a player in the Bay Area and then also in the Midwest, I think. Um, she did this like diving backwards layout grab full extension catch that was a no look. I think it was 50% luck because she wasn't looking. It was just like, ah. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I guess sometimes I'm just amazed at, at, at practice, like riot players do amazing things. Hannah, Hannah Kwai has done some really intense, amazing things. So there's a lot of plays that could have been lost to time that are just practice plays. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, I get that it's not as intense, but think of how many more plays happen at practice and you have a little room to make some errors. So yeah. you try some crazy things. Yeah. Sam's uh, there's a player on a team named Sam who on her like first play, she's this young player. She laid out so high and then just landed in a pile of dust. And it was just like an explosion. <laughs> and those kinds of things stick in my head. I'm like, what are you doing? One, one of the things that you talked a little bit about in uh, the post on, on the ultimate blog is uh, about being a, a biracial player and coming from this community where you didn't necessarily feel like you fit and then finding a, a place that you felt more comfortable. I, I really want to ask about that as, as someone who's biracial myself, I have a black parent and a white parent. Uh, how, have, how has your experience changed and evolved as the community has changed, how they interact with players of color and black players? Sure. I like um, when I started playing for Stanford, I really like lost the sense of being at all different, you know, or uh, brown. And that was kind of a breath of fresh air and, and amazing. And I think I just lived in a little bit of oblivion for a while. And then more recently, now that uh, people have become more conscious of inequities and, and things like that, it all of a sudden it's like, whoa, like you are brown, you are brown. And now I'm having to pay attention to it. And I'm like, oh yeah, I am brown. Ah. So I got to like <laughs> uh, forget about it for a while because I didn't feel like I was treated any differently. And now it, because of the consciousness around it, I feel like I'm much more conscious about it um, for better or for worse. I think probably for better now that people are more aware, but um I, I almost, well, when downtown Brown was established, like um, I kind of didn't, I never played with them because I always wanted to play with my friends who uh, weren't necessarily Brown. And there was a moment where uh, I think it was Slap and Frankus they decided to put together a downtown Brown team that was going to be good and try to win potlatch or try to perform well at potlatch. And then I was like, Oh, I can get, a, I can get on that. Like now, now we're talking my language. I, I just wasn't in the mode of wanting to be good um, and win things. And so um, they put together that team and it was like, I want to say like Mike Namkung and, um, like just some outstanding players. And I was like, whoa, these are, you guys are all the like one Brown person on your team and you're all amazing. And we played and I think we got beat by the USA team, you know, the, the team that had was going to worlds um, that year in, in the semis. But I, I literally cried at some point. It was like, we were in the huddle and the, the feeling of, it was like a, an understanding that I didn't even know how to put into words that they like just the, the little things that I would say that would be the beat of a song that, you know, my team probably wouldn't pick up on, you know, my like normal team wouldn't pick up on. But when I said that those lyrics, like other people heard it and like said it back to me and I was like, Whoa, you actually knew that song that I said that is never caught, you know? Um, and that was like a that was a real memorable experience to uh, feel, you know, like connected with that community, kind of for the first time. So, uh, and then I, I think I I also 
I'm, I'm like a light skin brown person. So there's some privilege there, uh, that I know I didn't have to deal with a lot of the things that I'm sure a lot of brown or darker skin people have to deal with on our sport and that maybe I've witnessed and, and disregarded because I, I wasn't aware myself. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting ride, especially these last couple of years where this has come to the awareness of our community. Yeah. And do you feel, I mean, it's not exactly a shocking statement to say that Ultimate is not particularly diverse. Um, a lot of people coming from the same socioeconomic background, obviously a lot of white people. Um, what can Ultimate do to to become more diverse and to be more welcoming to players of color? Yeah, um, good question. And, and when I think back about like where I came from and what made, what drew me to the sport, it was trying to erase, you know, things. Um, and now we're at a level where we're trying to like bring people in. Um, actually this came up last night in the, the hall of fame, we have a board of directors and we're trying to just become more aware and make sure we're, um, making things equitable and creating a system that, you know, doesn't exclude people, um, and, and how to encourage more, you know, people of color to play. It really does. It is a huge system, right? Because most of us started playing in college. I mean, now we're starting to get to high school, junior high, um, and elementary school, but really a lot, a lot of this is college and there's already the barrier there, right? Because like brown people, uh, have less access in, in a lot of ways. Um, so one suggestion was all these, uh, like, black colleges or like historic, you know, called, uh, like, do they have teams who, know, you know, do we know how, has anyone ever discussed trying to get, uh, now set up a way to have a team on their campuses? Um, how do we include the, you know, the organizations like ultimate impact, just trying to bring it, bring ultimate in other ways. Um, something I personally was, interested in is uh being a female brown role model to people in Africa and just going over there and just giving them somebody to look at who's playing the sport. I mean I don't even look like them, but at least I'm one step closer uh <laughs> than than what they've seen before. And and you know I feel like they did they were like oh like if she can throw a huck, I can throw one too. And immediately, boom, they just start throwing hucks. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like, <laughs> wow. You know, so it's just having that exposure, showing people, people who look like them, you know, it's the same thing as our vice president, um, just seeing, okay, that's possible. Maybe I can do that too. So exposure, um, outreach, all those things. I think there are a lot of people who who underestimate the power of representation and seeing somebody else doing those types of things. And I think a lot of those people come from a position of privilege where they're so used to it that they don't they don't even notice that it's everything feels possible for them. And it doesn't necessarily feel that way for everybody else until you see someone's breaking those barriers. So uh, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of value there. Um, I know that. So I tweet. I know I tweeted at least once, maybe multiple times. Uh, that one of my goals in my career was to be your teammate at some point to play on a team with you. Did I miss my window? Is it, is, is the window closed? Am I, am I not going to get my chance? As, as long as you promise I don't blow out my ACLs, I'm coming. I'll play. I, and I, and I, I won't let you get on a bike either, you know? Okay. Uh, that's really sweet. Thank you. That's really nice. I do remember when you tweeted that. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to know that the opportunity is still out there because uh, it could be like summer league. It could be downtown Brown or something, but I'm, I'm, I'm still yeah. shooting for it. Got to yeah. go to Potlatch, Keith. I, I've always wanted to. Uh, if we could have it again, it's not Potlatch anymore, but that's true. Uh, Sunbreak. Sunbreak. Uh, Sunbreak. Sunbreak. I, I could be persuaded. We'll see what happens. Man, we got to bring back that like – I mean, this is the days of the future, right? But we got to bring back the 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 DJ at the fields, you know, like that was huge. I don't know, are they still doing that? 
I haven't seen that in a while, but I think it's a great idea. I, you know, I think they still do it in Europe. Beer garden and DJ at the fields. I'll DJ. I'll bring all my stuff. We'll do it. We yeah. Can have guests. We can have multiple rotating DJs. Mm-hmm. It'd be good times. Um, well, Dom, thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on and talking with us. And uh, congratulations on an, on an awesome career. And, uh, you know, we'll see, though. You know, you say you retire, but. <laughs> Let's see, we're gonna have to, could Jay Z, Michael Jordan, you know, could, could come uh, back. Oh man, yeah. I'll try. Uh, I'll try golf for a while, and then I'll. There you go. <laughs> disc golf is it's happening right now. Yeah. Wait. Did you mean uh, golf or disc golf? Yeah. Right. Good. Point. I, I was I was saying golf, but disc golf. I feel like that's legal. Like those women are they're throwing that frisbee real far. <laughs> they do. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well. Thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on with us, Dom. Thanks, both of you. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back on Deep Look. Hi, my name is Melissa Whitmer, and today I want to talk to you about why I think you should become a Frisbee coach before you are ready. Now, there's two parts of ultimate Frisbee coaching. There's Frisbee knowledge and then there's coaching skills. And I think too many ultimate players wait to even think about coaching because they think of it as something they might do in the distant future, something they might do maybe when they retire, but they're missing out on the opportunity to develop some coaching skills now. And here's why I think it's important. So number one, there are so many, so many coaching skills that have nothing to do with ultimate Frisbee skills. Um, And if you want to think about becoming a Frisbee coach someday or now, it would be helpful to think about what's your specialty specialty going to be. Um, So not everyone's going to be a tactical specialist or a strategic specialist. There's so many parts of coaching. You could be um, good at helping players set goals and achieve them or mental toughness. These are skills that you can bring to Frisbee, but don't have to do with Frisbee skills. Or maybe you want to focus on physical preparation and bring that to your team. Or maybe you want to focus on team cohesion, becoming a good teammate, teaching others how to be good teammates, or being an example of how to be a good teammate. There are so many things you can work on now, even if you're a really new player. And even if you're a new player, you can still start developing your your Frisbee skills. If you know one thing that someone else doesn't know, then you can start developing your ability to explain those things clearly and transfer your knowledge. And I think it's super important. The other reason it's super important, even if you're not coaching, is this. All of the things that are coaching skills are also things that are going to be good leadership skills. So if you have a team full of players who have developed some ability to to transmit knowledge to one another, to share their skills with one another, to support one another the way a coach does. I mean, how unstoppable is that team going to be? So um, I really want you to think about this. What can you start working on now with regards to your coaching skills, whether you plan on coaching tomorrow or coaching 20 years from now or just being a good teammate? And if you want to get some uh, knowledge, you want to get some skills and you want to get inspired, then sign up for our conference. It's coming up, it's free to register, and you can find us at theuap.com. Welcome back to Deep Look. Thank you so much to Dom Fontanet for joining us and chatting with us uh, on, and you know, she she's just great to talk to. I feel like, I feel like once she could become an analyst, for ultimate frisbee if if she's into the idea you know she could come out and do color commentary i think she's very engaging to talk to and obviously knows the game at an incredibly high level it, definitely and somebody who makes you feel like you know her like i yes. like you feel like you're your old friends when you get to get to chat with her that's something i've always appreciated about dom and then you, know, you look at t- let's tie the room together from the beginning of the show to the to where we are now I mean, you look at all the winning i mean in some ways uh there's a tom brady Don Fontenelle, like kind of comparison. It's a lot of winning, a lot of titles, okay. All right. more world titles for Dom than for uh, for Tom Brady. That's for That's sure. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, 
Dom Fontanette is definitely in the conversation for like goat status of this generation. I think I, I don't I don't know that I quite get there. I think it probably goes to Alex Snyder just because of the like extreme level of dominance at the position for so long but i mean dom fontanet has been an amazing o cutter for forever i mean you know 26 years right i mean wins a callahan award wins a college championship wins club championship so i I think it's uh you know it how many players get put in the hall of fame before the end of their career i mean that's what you need to know uh, like not it doesn't happen yeah it's basically it doesn't happen but it's just like she was so good that they were like we got why wait (laughs) <laughs> Why wait? <laughs> we know what we're doing. I, I, I don't wait? actually know if I agree with that decision overall. I think probably the Hall of Fame should wait for players <laughs> because it's a little fraught. It's a little fraught with peril. There's like a slippery well, slope. I don't know if there's a slippery slope, but I just think like it's fine to just wait for her to retire and then put her in the hall like immediately. What's uh, the rush? But whatever. I I think it's pretty cool, and uh, it's it was cool to hear that she's also involved with the Hall of Fame which is make, we're doing lots of work right now behind the scenes. I think there's work to eventually establish a physical Hall of Fame in New Jersey. Did you know that, Keith? I did not know that. Yeah. It's, it's a good, it's, good spot. It's in the works. It's in the works. I, I, I was surprised when she was like, I, I thought I was just going to slip out the back door. And I was like, it's, it's, the words are Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do in our subscriber bonus segment today, we hope you join us, is we're going to talk about players who are active now that we think could get into the Hall of Fame. Ooh. So we're, you know, there's obviously a bunch of players who are no longer active, who are probably going to get into the hall, but we're going to look at the kind of the current landscape and think about, all right, you know, who could, who could get the Dom Fontenet treatment and get put in the hall, you know, at the, right at the end of their career, um, or, or just have hall of fame level, uh, trajectory so far. So we will do that in our subscriber bonus. You can become a subscriber at ultiworld.com slash subscribe for less than four dollars per month all right keith that is going to do it for today's show thank you so much for tuning in to this edition of deep look again if you haven't uh, already check us out on youtube we've got the video version of the show and uh it'll be going up there every week so thank you for joining us and we will talk to you next week right here on deep look